Good afternoon and welcome to webinar four in our series on remote teaching from Cambridge University Press. This time we're looking at planning your course. And before we get stuck in, did anybody see the big piece of news about Cambridge this week? You can type your responses in the chat box. I've been having lots of concerned text messages from <laughs> Okay, lots of notifications from outside the chat room, interestingly. Okay, so most people have heard. So it was, a, it was announced in the press um, on BBC that, um, that Cambridge is going to be delivering all of its lectures online in the next academic year. It's actually only going to be in the autumn term, so it's a little bit over-reported, and then we're basically going to see what we are permitted to do after that um, and with other teaching instances with smaller group teaching depends what the what the rules are around all of those things i'm just going to get my chat window back because it all disappeared um exactly there's the varsity who got it started um, anyway so today we're going to look at our context a little bit and see where we are today in respect to it, in respect to the term that we've just finished and how we plan ahead for the term that's coming. I'm going to take you through some principles of course design. It's be a bit of a whirlwind tour, but you don't need to learn them all just to be aware of them and look at some proactive student support rather than reactive responsive only. And I've made you a present, which you may or may not have been able to download beforehand. We had a bit of an issue with it earlier on. That is um, OK, so Andrew, everything is still being discussed. So. It, the possibility is there, but it might not be confirmed. OK, <laughs> um, so I've made you a present. If you've managed to download it, brilliant. If not, don't worry, you'll get it in a link after the session. Um, and then we'll work through the process that you'll need to use in order to use that present to help you with the, the coming term. So looking at the old normal, so we've got in the old normal, we used to have lectures, which are large, large group interactions with lots of content being given across and some interaction depending on the subject, depending on the individual and the nature of the class, the rapport with the class. In a uh, complementary position to that, there was a seminar, smaller group uh, discussions for much more in-depth uh, exploration of the topics and extension of what came up in the lecture. Almost um, quite frequently looking at things that students had done in between times. So both of those were fine. Then coronavirus happened and both of those events went online to varying degrees of success. And we now have to think about what went well and what went less well so that we can do the right things when we come into the next term. In addition to all of that, <laughs> In addition to all of that, we have this news about lectures going completely online in the in the coming year, which may or may not happen. We've got one in five students are considering deferring until the following year because they don't necessarily believe that it's going to be exactly the same. A load of students signed a position to get their fees back with only PowerPoints online for learning materials, which is not really worth the fees. So there are a lot of different feelings out there about how this emergency situation has happened and what expectations there might be for next year. So if, like I say, if we take the best of what we've managed to do this term and make that more systematic for next term, then I think we're in a really good position. So the new normal. If we take the group size instead, it's large group and small group. So in large group, it's content dissemination, small group, much more discussion. And we think about it in the way that we talked about it a couple of weeks ago in that we're maintaining our live sessions to focus on connection with people, not necessarily with content, but around the content. And there will be some content, but a lot of the content that can be given to students can be made available self-access in, in advance, ideally, but also even um, lecture recordings and the recording from today will be made available later as well. That counts as um, self-access material as well. And there has been some uh, research around Cambridge that has been done both by tech institutions and by student union um, organisations uh, that basically have said that students are having difficulty, some difficulty with um, interacting with the technology. So that's kind of what the blocker is at the moment, more so than 
anything else pedagogical it's the technology that people are still struggling with and that's very preliminary nothing has been uh, nothing has been published yet but kind of looking at the respondents so far those are kind of some of the trends that are emerging um, but the recordings to lectures have been very highly valued so the asynchronous the self access side of what we have the power to provide now has been very well received so when we look at the small group side of that we're again keeping the live sections for connection with people and um, discussing the topics and deepening people's understandings and extending and pushing their boundaries a little bit and in self-access there will be either content or activity so something that the students will have to do um, in order to bring into the discussion to get feedback on so that they can they can um, extend from there. So a couple of weeks ago, I made a very controversial um, suggestion um, by suggesting that some concepts be brought into asynchronous learning so that we could reduce the number of hours spent live, which is quite a tricky time, as we're seeing from from the feedback that's coming in at the moment, um, so that people can access content when it is suitable for them. And then when they're ready, they can come in and talk to people with their peers, with you guys, and really extend their understanding of those things and build the things together. Now that is it's a tricky picture um, because we're calling it preparation and a lecture. Everybody knows that the lecture is essential and we absolutely have to be at the lecture. You can't miss that because your attendance is possibly taken um, and preparation as well. I can do it or maybe I can just show up and I can read it later if I absolutely have to. So if instead we change the mindset about that and call it. And call it asynchronous coursework and synchronous coursework, then the two things become much more equal in value. So it's about how we communicate this to students before they sign up, maybe before or just after they apply in their orientation in uh, transition programs that we might provide to make sure that students know that there are these two parts. And even by providing recorded lectures, we are creating asynchronous coursework as well. So the things that can make this work are including asynchronous coursework in the time estimation for the course. So instead of calculating a course based on the number of lecture hours, so this course is eight, eight, eight lectures long, it's eight hours long. That's not really a valid calculation in the way that we are needing to work these days. So what are we what are we providing in content and activities asynchronously? How long will that take them and how long will they spend in synchronous online? discussion or lecture style interaction with us. What are the aims of each side um, and how do they interact with one another? Grade it, make sure that it is part of the of the final grade. Your teacher presence also, um, this is very, very fast. I have a whole presentation on this and I can share the slides with you after if that's of interest. Um, but the teacher presence thing is about providing guidance to people when they're online without you. Um, you don't have to be there all the time, but you need to put a message to say I'm here and I'm here to support you and also providing feedback. So anything that the students do online when they come back into a live situation, you need to comment on that. Well done. That was great. Everybody in the class managed to access that. What did you think of it? So that your your presence when they are working online is noted. So you show that you are you are part of that journey even when you're not in the room with them. And then integrating both in terms of aims, but also leading activities. All of these things count towards making the asynchronous coursework as valuable and as compulsory, really, as the synchronous coursework when it comes to building the overall aims together. So some principles of course design, as I promised in the beginning. So course design is a very careful thing. There are a lot of things to be considered um, when you go about designing a course. I'm sure you know this from the beginning of every term as you're preparing for your uh, for the coming term, all the whole series of lectures, the assignments, everything that has to be put in together. So I'm going to put up some principles of online course design and I would like you to look at them and tell me which ones of these are valid only for online work. So if you read through the list and type the number in the chat box of the item that you feel is only valid for online work. I'm going to wait until I get a response. <laughs> None, correct. <laughs> Possibly one. OK, so 
the idea really is that it follows basically the same pattern as uh, face to face course design. So when we look at online course design, we need to be much more careful about including all of these structures because we are not there to kind of remedially explain some instruction that wasn't immediately understood. So if somebody read, reads something that I don't I don't really get this, you can immediately say, actually, it's this and you need to access that and talk to these people and then produce this document. So you can clarify straight away, whereas when students are online, they don't have that. So you need to have these things much more explicitly written down in a logical order so that students can do without you a little bit until they get to a live session. So learning outcomes are really your guiding light and they make all the decisions for you. It, everything needs to be very learner centric, focusing on them, you know, predictable structure so that every week I know more or less I'm going to have to watch this document, watch this video. I'm going to have to um, read through these documents. I'm going to have to create that, work through these, this problem sheet. And that's my pattern. I know that that's what I have to do. I have more or less, I've got a good idea of how long that's going to take me. So it helps my well-being, my general mental health to know that I can plan in the amount of time that I need and I can get it all done. Assessing action and assessing learning are two complementary things. An inauthentic task or assessment, <laughs> we'll come to that, it's on a later slide. Um, asynchronous work wherever possible. So all of the struggles that people have had have been with synchronous technology. Um, so as much as you can, put things online so people can access them for themselves when flexible. And if we just make sure that all of the microphones are off, please. Um, student support, effective means kind of emotional, academic and technical are the kind of the three points of the triangle of that. And then very much focusing on authentic tasks and teacher presence as I explained in the last last bit. So this is quite a lot and it's not all the principles. Um, and if you're starting to uh, write out your course um, and get it, get it going now, having to incorporate all of these things is a little bit complicated. So, like I say, I made you a present. It might not be the gift you've always dreamed of, uh, but hopefully it'll be useful to you. And if you don't like it, feel free to feel free to re-gift it. I won't be offended. Um, so what I've made for you is a storyboard. In the chat box, can you tell me what the word storyboard means to you? It's used in lots of different contexts. So have you heard it before and what does it mean to you? An outline, yeah, sketch your plan. Mm -hmm. Outline of a narrative, yeah, plotting out in a film, it's used a lot for those, yeah, planning and overview. Yep, underlying narrative structure, brilliant. Okay, a shot by shot outline. So it's a little bit of a little bit of both. So a storyboard is essentially, it is the structure of your course. So it is, it is structured out. Um, it's potentially a visual explanation depending on what you're doing. Um, in course design, it is also a collection of every word that is going to appear on screen throughout your entire course. So the structure is there and also the detail of what goes in the structure is there. So that when you come to build your course, you just need this one document and the assets that are linked to from it, and then you put it in straight away. So you don't need to worry about the content while you are worrying about the build. Because when you try to do the two things at the same time, things get left out and then maybe some students don't get feedback or an asset gets missed out out or whatever. There are lots of lots of different reasons to, to separate out the two processes. It is very like a syllabus, yeah, but it's very, very detailed also. So I'm going to show you this is an example of can I just get a quick yes or no in the chat? Have you managed to download this already? It was linked to in your welcome email or in your reminder email. OK. OK, if you tried twice, there was a problem earlier on, but it's it's fixed now. OK, great. So lots of people have and try again if it didn't work because it does. It should work now. So in the document, it is seven. It is seven pages long, uh, but it's not prose. It's separated into the into this kind of tabular format. So in, in it, it's basically a massive fill the gap exercise. Um, so wherever you see yellow, there is instruction for text for you to put in. So this is assuming that um, uh, you will be able to get the email AH. Um, we can sort that out for you later on. So in each section, you 
look at instructions and text and the kind of text that needs to be in there. So in that very first box, it says brief paragraph, maximum 75 words. Each week you will do X, then Y, then etc. So you need to just kind of spell out what the course is and you can uh, create a visual. You should create a visual explanation of the structure of the course with a text explanation below. So in that course structure section that will go in there. So this document is basically um, it is basically to guide your thinking um, along the kinds of things that you need to include to create an online or blended course. And it's, it is blended that we're looking at just now because we're providing some work asynchronously and we're providing some uh, either online synchronous time or face to face synchronous time if uh, if we're all well enough to provide that in the autumn. Um, so literally have a look through I've provided wording for you if you want to use that it's not uh, um, it's not obligatory but it's a starter it's a starting point by visual I will show you in a second um, you get rid of the menu bar by clicking away from it I think um, is the easiest bit um, so anyway in the comments on the side there's rationale for why include a certain thing. There's the maximum word count for each one is because on on the screen, lots of words is just really painful to read and it's psychologically difficult to sit down to a big long page of text on a web page, whether that's on Moodle or edX or whatever it is that you're using. Um, it's You need to keep things really succinct. So I've put in word limits um, all around the place. So have a look through that when you get it and I'll show you some examples from it and some examples live. This course template is based on a course that went live in February, um, which was uh, received very well by both students and um, academics in kind of neighbouring um, neighboring subject areas. So this was for medieval manuscripts in the digital age, which is very niche in uh, English department and ASNAC, Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic studies were very interested in as well, as were engineering. So this it's the structure that is applicable to all of these things. Um, the storyboard is not to be shared with students, but the visual is. Yes, absolutely. So I will come to the visual in a second and you should definitely share your visual with your students. They need to know it's a key part of the student support mechanism. So speaking of student support, um, the image on the screen would suggest that student support is for catching people when they fall in the water. But in actual fact, if we put up a railing, then we could stop them falling into the water in the first place. So the student support structures that we want to put in place in our course are the railing. We want to stop people falling in. Some people will still fall in. Maybe it's not a very high railing, very tall people are gonna, you know, they'll, they'll topple over anyway. But we still have our ring that can get them out. But what we want to do is proactively create support so that people feel comfortable and confident and able to do these things. Not least because at the moment we need to foster more independence in our, in our students, which is traditionally potentially not something that we have focused on in the past. So the very first thing is your course plan, which includes your um, your course visual. So it's it lays out what you're going to do every week and why and how it's related to the assessment um, and what students are expected to do. There's a statement of learning outcomes, both for the whole course and for each cycle, each learning cycle. Um, which and by learning cycle, I mean the lecture plus whatever other materials you've made available online or the tutorial plus whatever activity you've asked them to do beforehand. We need to look closely at accessibility. So um, documents marked up at the very least marked up with headings and meaningful hyperlinks. And I've sent links to those before um, an accessible video with transcripts. If you can't manage um, if you can't manage uh, captions, then transcripts are your kind of uh, back up your kind of plan up plan B. You need to provide a consistent learning pattern so that there's predictability, like I was saying before. Um, and within that predictability, you need a variety of learning activities. Not everybody likes to learn the same way and not every individual likes to learn the same way all the time. So vary your learning activities and vary your assessment activities as well. So making sure that you have all of these things written and communicated 
to the students at the beginning so that they've got something to refer to at any time that they um, they get lost. OK, so coming back to the visual that you are asking me about, um, this is the course plan template course visual. So it explains the structure of the course that I have kind of given to you. So essentially you start off with an orientation section and you finish with your assessment section, which is not necessarily something that you would have uh, thought about in advance of face to face teaching, but that definitely need to be there before you start your um, the rest of your course planning and certainly before the students start to start learning. So in this sample cycle, um, you I've broken up the the cycle of learning into two sections. So the first section is a lecture preceded by some asynchronous coursework so that will access the materials themselves beforehand and that they are closely linked. And then in part two, they've got an assignment that depends on what they learned in the lecture that will then feed into the tutorial. And I in the template, I have put in some support and some text for you to try the share and review section. Um, but if you're not feeling very confident, maybe take that bit out and just work on assignment and tutorial. So my reasoning for this this set is that lecture and tutorial everybody's very used to, but asynchronous coursework, and asynchronous assignment, asynchronous sharing and review, those might potentially be new to people. So I have created as much structure as I can around doing those things. Um, and I'm very interested to hear if you use this and whether you would, um, how helpful it has been. So by cycle, on my on my diagram here, I've got day one to day 12. So in um, in this one, when I started to create this, normally I would assume that a student would have a lecture on a particular topic and in the same week would have a tutorial on that topic. But then putting in also asynchronous coursework for them to access before the lecture, plus an assignment to do before the tutorial, that's not necessarily going to work in a five day, Monday to Friday uh, cycle. So I made this two weeks long. And if we are going to be able to reduce contact time to be able to pro to provide more asynchronous work, then that is it's a reasonable way of going about it. Um, OK, anyway, I'll, I'll try and make sure I don't have any more images where the where the toolbar goes in, in future sessions. But the timing is something that you need to think about very carefully because asynchronous coursework, while it might be half an hour of work, that half an hour of work needs to be done in a window of three days, maybe, depending on the person's access to devices, their um, ability to get time alone to, to concentrate. Um, so you need to give people a longer window than you would for the actual work if you, they were sitting down in a room with you. So it is something to bear in mind as you go through. So the reason I'm calling this a cycle is because there are multiple parts in it and the length of it depends on what you want it to be. Um, one cycle per topic or a theme within a lecture course, um, that's up to you. It depends on how you want to break up all the pieces of your um, of your overall outcomes for the for the entire course. Um, but I'm happy to, to talk about that more later. So designing your course, first of all, the very first thing you need to do is your um, is your learning outcomes. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, Alicia, that's the that's the thing. Right now we have the opportunity to plan for the whole course in advance and to potentially look at where we are headed more structurally. And this this method is actually your best insurance against change in the coming term. So if you plan to have as much content as you can asynchronously delivered and then have your face to face time or contact time either live or either genuinely face to face or online then you get the majority of your content created or curated in such a way that it can be delivered asynchronously then you don't have to uh, chase after what is um, kind of chasing after creating content you can just sit sit back, not quite sit back, but you can sit back a little and pay more attention to the emerging needs of your students as they go. So this is literally, this is your best insurance against kind of um, pivots within within the system. OK, I seem to have frozen. Can everybody see and hear me now? OK, marvellous. OK, I said, can you hear me? And then I stopped talking. That wasn't very helpful. Anyway, <laughs> OK, so 
the first thing we need to do in uh, designing the course is to set our learning objectives. So there are three learning outcomes written on the board. I would like you to have a quick look at them and tell me which one isn't really any good. So A, convince the board to pivot your business model. Understand the six degrees of innovation. Use the six degrees of innovation to plan how you will clearly identify the details of your new business model. Yes, B is not particularly brilliant. Can anybody tell me why? On AOL, exactly. Define, understand. Yes, it's a passive verb is um, is the tricky one. So if you use active verbs in your outcomes, they're much easier to define, they're much easier to test, and they're much easier to use to create authentic assessments later on. Yeah, so active verbs also are fine. Okay, so in the there are so there are two outcomes that have active verbs. So convince and use and in fact plan as well. So one of these is course level. And one of these would be learning cycle or week week level, which which one would be which? Which one is convince the board to pivot your business model? Potentially. It's actually the other way around. OK, so convince is the course level and use and plan our learning cycle level. So the way yes exactly c is part of a so using the six degrees of innovation to plan how you will clearly identify the details of a new business model um you will need to be able to do that in order to be able to do a um these are actual outcomes from a course that i co-created two or three years ago now um on funnily enough business model innovation um at uh, judge business school executive education so these main aims and subordinate aims almost are complementary to each other. You need one for the other. And if you only learn how to use the six degrees of innovation, what are you going to do with that? And therefore, how do you define the assessments later on? So within a particular learning cycle, and this could be a week, and we can call it weeks if you want. So within a week, there will be a core learning outcome and there will be subordinate or supporting learning outcomes. So you need to Go through your outcomes for your course and figure out which ones are which per, over over time. So in the ones from the example previously, we're looking at planning how to experiment. And in order to be able to do that, we need to start at the bottom by exploring the six degrees of innovation. We need to relate the six degrees to our current context and our in for those students, the businesses that they uh, they belong to, and then you also need to work, do work around effective planning and communications. So since these three lower lower aims um, all contribute to the main aim of that particular learning cycle, we take the main aim in contact time. That's where we spend the most of our time because we need to be able to be 100% sure that our students can do this at the end of the session. And we put the others in asynchronous coursework so that they can do this before they come along. And you can tell whether people have done it or not because they can or can't contribute to the discussion and the planning around how to experiment. Um, and it is important that they know that doing that work beforehand is important, not just for the activity, but also for the assessment overall. So integrating the things, integrating the activities for your supporting aims with the activities for your main aims is basically the kind of gold standard of what you're looking for in um, in blended delivery. So on the screen here, I've got class one online work and class two. So you, you basically move from one through the online work into class two. And it's not just a bit of like homework. It's not something uh, that I've just asked you to do because I didn't get through the work in the class. It's it is important it's essential to you achieving all of the learning outcomes for this course by the end of this section so everything everything matters and 
it's a single journey with various steps. Everything contributes to the same goal and each part needs to be complementary to the other parts. So at no point should you ever repeat anything. The one thing that will discourage people the most from doing their online work is you repeating that in a live session because anybody who was conscientious enough to do it the first time will come into your class and you explain it again and they think, well, there was no point in me doing that. I'm not doing it next time. So don't repeat, but pull it in. Exactly. So there's there is um, good connection with college supervisions in previous system, um, and it's just when you're des designing your course, you need to plan that in a little bit uh, more in a more structured way, just to make sure that we hit all of those things. And you know, the communication I'm sure between lecturers and supervisors will be really clear, particularly given that we're going into another new situation um, in uh, in autumn. So to get started, the core bit, the most familiar bit is the synchronous events, what were lectures and uh, undergraduate supervisions or uh, tutorials, whatever they're called in your institution. You need to plan those first. They feel the most comfortable, plan them and identify where there is too much content being delivered and perhaps think about taking it out and delivering it in a different way. So you want to focus on the connection with people. So thinking back to our first webinar about asking questions and finding out about people's context, finding out about what is difficult for them or whether they've read the news differently um, or any of those things that not just the content, focus, focus people around the content, but no, don't focus so entirely on it as we might have done before. You want to revisit the ideas in asynchronous work and expand on them. So you take it as read that people have some understanding and give them challenging things to stretch themselves into something new, not just adding something else onto a list, really build on those and take take advantage of the golden time that, that these synchronous events are. And as I was saying before, do not repeat. Repeating is a bad plan, so I'll stop doing that now. So if you want to, the, these three points are about the putting the things together. So in the first three webinars, we looked at individual letter time individual tutorial supervision time and individual instances of, of content that you put out. Now we're looking at putting them all together. So if you want to know more about those individual instances, then please, uh, the recordings are available or refer to your notes if you are here. Um, but for today, we're thinking about how we put those pieces together to make a coherent course that is really good, strongly supported for our students. So once you've got your synchronous time together, your asynchronous time needs to be planned as well. And I think this, this image uh, demonstrates really nicely what asynchronous time is. So you've provided a load of content and maybe there's somebody who wants to stretch themselves. Fantastic, they're going to go for it. Maybe there's someone who, who is able to help someone else, in which case they can get stuck in as long as you have made the appropriate facilities available. And maybe there's someone else who just wants to observe quietly and not really worry about it. And then you've got somebody in the background who has to get something out of her bag. So maybe it's night times, a different time zone. They're, they're all engaged in different things around this one, one um, plan that you have for them, but they're not on the same page. But it's OK. It is OK and they will all get there as long as there is an overall structure that they know how to follow and that you bring things back in into the live bit. Um, we can share that link uh, at the end or uh, somebody can share it in the chat. OK, so for your asynchronous activities, and I'll show you an example of this in a second from Medieval Manuscripts. So you need to decide what the students need to do to be able to meet their outcomes. So that's part of how you've planned your synchronous uh, session and then you put your pull out learning outcomes and content and put them together into the, the asynchronous bit. How do you fill in all the gaps so that they can do that live, live activity with you when the time comes? You want to create or curate your assets and we talked about creating or curating in the past. One of them is very time consuming, but very bespoke and one of them is less time consuming, but might not be exactly exactly what you want. Around your assets, around your main content, you need to create blurb. So you need to create instructions and reasoning why something needs to happen and reflection activities perhaps or knowledge checks. So we talked about quizzes before. Quizzes are super important here, um, either as predictive questions 
or as um, as knowledge checks afterwards. You know, don't confuse the name of the tool with the function that you're using it for. So we also use a tool. Um, we also use a survey tool for surveying the students on their experience, but we also use it to prompt them to reflect. So you get a, a picture of how confident students are at the beginning and at the end. And I've provided wording in the template for that um, if you require. Um, so these things all come together in your asynchronous uh, plan. Be realistic about how much time the students have. So no matter how you plan your cycle of learning, be aware of how much time there is between one deadline and the next. And next week we're going to talk about doing asynchronous communicative activities in managing communities. So we will look specifically at planning deadlines through a week that are realistic for people to be able to achieve to keep up. There's lots of people talk about um, this ability to access content whenever you want and it's so flexible and we're all grand procrastinators. So if there's no final deadline, it's quite easy to just kind of let it all go. So if you have a, a kind of deadlines for windows of time that work needs to be done in, maybe you're only asking them to do an hour, an hour and a half worth of work, but you give them a week to do it in. It gives them the flexibility, but also gives them the structure and you the ability to keep the whole cohort moving together, which is really important because otherwise you're going to end up in 51 to 1 conversations with people at different stages of their learning and that's a disaster. Don't go there. So creating strong links between asynchronous activity and synchronous activity is another really important thing and we'll look at that in the example. So again, if you want to find out more about producing or curating the assets themselves, there's more information in communicating your ideas online. Um, this is, like I say, very much about creating the links between the pieces. So this is a screenshot which you'll probably not be able to see very well, but that's OK. I don't need you to read every single word. This is one section of uh, medieval manuscripts in the digital age, and it is essentially the part of a learning cycle that is preparation. It's the asynchronous coursework and it has various elements in it. So can anybody tell me straight off where is the main content? Exactly, it's in the video. All right, yeah. So we made this. It looks great. I'm not going to show you, but it does. Um, we had the, uh, because it was with manuscripts, we had the SMEs in the library manipulating the manuscripts and it's, it's all fantastic. But we did this um, very much pre-COVID and with the timelines that we would normally take to design a course properly. So this is great. Um, it's not a video there, but I'm sure I can find a way to, to let you see it in some way. I'll think about that afterwards. Um, so the main video is the content. The main content is the video which was created. There is also, if you can see behind your menu bar, um, further content at the bottom, which is curated. So the course team didn't have to create all of this content, but the, the created part and the curated part together make up a really nice, um, a nice bunch, a nice constellation of content that the students have to go for. So it is also in, oh, there's all this other text on the screen. So we've got instructions, watch the video. And the reason for watching, it's not just watch the video for watching a video because I made it, um, to find out, blah, blah, blah. So there, you're kind of selling the idea of doing it beforehand. Um, one of the things that has come back in preliminary um, of scanning of, of uh, responses to surveys is that students are not feeling hugely motivated to work at the moment um, and to participate. So the big sell, the big sell needs to be um, put on basically everything that you're asking them to do. Do this because if you don't have ready-made videos of your own, you need to curate those options or you can make them and that is in webinar two. It's all about that. Um, so you've got your instructions and your reasons for watching. You then have preparatory questions, activating schemata and generating interest in the topic that's coming up, further motivating people to want to want to see the video to see what it has to say. 
And after the content, you've got follow up questions which help students think about what they've just seen in relation to what they're going to be doing. So the preparatory questions are almost linking back and the follow up questions link forward. And in both sets of questions, you've got the instruction to take notes. So take notes on the following questions, make notes on the following questions. These will be used to aid discussion in the class. OK, so it's written down. We will come back to this um, at another time. It's not just to keep you busy while I do something else. Um, there, there's a clear link and a clear pathway through what you're asking them to do. OK, and linked class. Yeah, so this is this is how it looks on screen. And in the template, I have created the table for you to fill in um, for when you do this yourself. So if you're creating, uh, if you're creating or finding videos, you're going to need to put the questions before and after. And I have created the space for you to fill that in and the word counts and all of that kind of thing. So hopefully creating something like this will not be too complicated. This one also is the easiest technically to do because we just type the questions in. So there's the students don't input anything. There's no data back or anything like that, but you get the information through the quality of their contributions to the to the discussion afterwards. So technically, if you're not feeling very confident with the technology, this is a really it's a good route to go down and it is very valid pedagogically speaking. In the template, there is also an option for you to create a quiz. So I've shown an example of how you need to create a quiz with the questions and answers and feedback because quizzes are teaching opportunities, not just testing opportunities. Um, this part was the asynchronous asynchronous coursework. And I think it is, I can check for you now. Please hold. So it's in topic, it's 1.1, asynchronous coursework is the section that you'll find that in. Okay, so that that's it looks very nice it's very clean and the you've got the tools to do that in the template the next thing that you need to do is plan your assignment and your assessments so these are obviously very important um, and you want to be able to assess people's participation the quality of their contributions um, as well as the proof that they've learned what you set out to give them uh, from the beginning so as the question came up in the beginning, authentic assessment. Ooh. Authentic assessments are, um, actually I'll give you the examples and you can tell me which ones are authentic. So there are three legitimate assessments on the screen. I'd like you to take a moment to read them and then type in the chat box which one is not authentic. To see how authentic my audience is first. Okay, we've got a strong showing for A. Marvellous, and a question mark, lovely. Okay, so A is a very typical higher education assessment task, um, and it is, it is authentic if what you are trying to do is it does exactly it depends what field this is in so if you're in english for example writing 4000 word essays is something that people are likely to be doing with the knowledge that they have later on they're going to be doing a lot of writing um so that that is authentic in that context but given the context that we've been working through in this session with the six degrees of innovation and uh pivoting the 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 business model, um, writing a proposal to the board to convince them to undertake major change is very authentic because the course that this was for was this was exactly what people were going to have to do um, when they went when they finished the course. So it is a very authentic assessment. Um, hopefully there will be other other authentic assessments that you can find for biological sciences or for other other topics. It's a question really of examining your learning outcomes. And uh, so you need to go through your learning outcomes and you need to change your verbs to being active. And some of the assessments will suggest themselves. Not everything can be assessed this way, but more than you would imagine can be. 
So planning a cycle of experimentation based on the six degrees of innovation that your company could undertake to assess feasible change. The difference between these two, between B and C, are in fact the same as the differences between the outcomes earlier on. So B and C are both authentic in that they reflect what the learners will have to do with that knowledge when their learning is finished. So B is authentic at the course level. So this was in fact our final assessment for the course and C was authentic at the learning cycle level. Exactly. Think about what you want your students to be able to do. And you know, sometimes it is just knowledge, but sometimes it is what do you do with it? What do you do with it later on? How is it useful to you? So looking at things based on your learning outcomes, based on active verbs in those, you can come up with really interesting and diversified assessments, which is something that in accessibility terms we have been kind of investigating the options for for a while. OK, and the very last thing you need to do is write the very first thing that the students will do is to write your orientation section. And when I started to prepare this, I thought, oh, here we go. We'll do the we'll do that. The the image with the signposts and the the, the blank bits so you can write in um, where it is you want people to go. And I thought that's not um, it's not very indicative of the kind of information that we need to get across to students in this learning mode. So we need something that's much more informative than you're going to look look at these topics. We need something that is digitally manipulable, that is available, that is presented in more than one way. So if you look at the map, I can see the steps or I can see the map, whichever is more suitable to me. So this is why I say we should prepare the course visual, so the visual of the course structure, but also a text explanation of how the course works. So that if you've got people who have difficulty reading or who don't like to read, they can understand straight away from, from the visual. But if you've got people who have visual impairments, then you have uh, the option of using a screen reader to, uh, to access the text. So there's lots of different ways that we need to provide the information and we are looking at a much more complex picture than what people traditionally understand as the university higher education experience. So what goes in your orientation section? You need to assess the time commitment and communicate this very clearly and include not only face-to-face uh, -face time but time expected for um, asynchronous work. You need to plan your teacher presence. So in your orientation section, you need to introduce the course, whether you do that in video or audio or in text. It doesn't really matter, but given that uh, students are going to feel a little bit isolated by uh, potentially spending more time socially distanced from students, because we still don't know how, it's, how things are going to pan out in the autumn, you need to be present, make yourself heard and seen so that they when they read you and you've established your voice they know who they're listening to um, and they feel a bit more connected so say how you'll interact and explain how you'll support them so in terms of interacting let me just go back to that bit you don't need to be online with on them with with them on facebook and whatsapp and all the rest but you do need to start discussions in forums. You need to encourage those discussions if that's what you choose to do. And you need to sum up and you also need to, in your live sessions, show that you've been listening all along, even if you're not, um, even if you're not actively participating all the way through. And saying how you'll support them, making that very clear on the very first page. And explain how you succeed in the course. So set out your expectations for activity. Um, make sure that the activities and content are linked to the live class and make your assessment and the criteria for passing both in terms of learning cycle and the whole course make those clear to the students the more transparent they can be the better supported the students will feel because they know what to do there's no mystery there's no finding out it's all there and it's in a document that they can see and potentially download from the very beginning it's a really big deal okay so this this is one excerpt of the medieval manuscripts course so of, that just explains the course structure. So what I've explained, I've explained lots of principles and lots of things that need to be included, but actually what appears on the screen is quite small. So in the course structure, the course is divided into four topics with a fifth final summary section. Each topic focuses on X and then you list them out. And then the visual is there 
and the text explanation of that is you'll do some preparation online before each classroom session, followed by consolidation work afterwards. So it's not uh, it's not overly complicated. And then you've got a downloadable co course overview as well. Again, for people who like to print that out and tick the boxes to feel like they've made progression. You can put tick boxes on Moodle and, uh, and on lots of other platforms as well, um, but some people just like to have a printout. So make one. You probably already have one for yourself, um, so you may as well make something similar available to your students. As long as you're planning all this in advance, this is all very, very doable. And I would suggest that you plan as much in advance as you possibly can to reduce your potential stress levels during the term as it starts. OK. OK. Uh, um, Preparation and consolidation can take different duration depending on the individual. How do you determine a realistic middle of the road estimate of time? Um, if you can, so in the first week, you can plan for what, how long you think it should take. Um, and then these, you make sure that you say that the time estimations are approximate. And at the end of the first week, ask the students how long they spent on it. And if you were wildly wrong, change it. So update the information in the course structure and in the information that you give out to the students before each week. So in this course, we also had um, at the beginning of each week, this week you're going to spend two hours doing blah, and it, it was all very clear. And there was um, multiple, uh, multiple instances of the time expectation being stated. Yep, and then faculty by faculty, there are different standards. Brilliant. OK, so that's that's the example. And this is all kind of framed for you in the template. So please do access the template, have a look at it and see where things will work or won't work for you. And if you think they won't work at all, then maybe delve a little deeper and see if there are parts of those things that might work that could be applicable if you change it. OK, anyway, so have a look and like I say, if you use the template, I'm very interested to hear what, how you got on with it and how it helped it or it didn't. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So if you would like to be, if you would like to be contacted about how you got on with the template, if you could write to higher education at cambridge.org, I will add you to a list that, and I will contact you later on in two to three weeks time to see whether you've used the template, whether it's been any use to you um, and how, what suggestions you would make if we were going to do that type of thing again, that would be super helpful. And if there's any questions about the content of today, please uh, email me or contact me at camthelp. Um, creating and managing your community, both your students community and your professional learning community uh, will be next week. We do have a couple of minutes if anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, uh, I'll have a quick scroll back in the meantime and see if there were any that I missed. But otherwise, hopefully see you next week. Thank you very much. How can continual, re oh, hang on. How can continual review spiraled practice be integrated in the learning cycle? This needs to occur throughout the semester. It needs to be planned in. Ideally, if you, you if you plan your course, you've got your default setting for your course that has a certain amount of time and a certain amount of expectation, certain type of task, etc. As you go, plan in your reviews at the end of every week. Ask students a really short survey. There is an example in the template, um, and from that feedback update and from that feedback update, any updates that you make, communicate those to your students and make sure that you're bringing in all of that feedback as you go through. And then when you're planning for the following term, then you can incorporate that feedback straight away. So your first term is essentially a pilot. Um, so if we were talking about this term just gone, this emergency term as being a prototype, next term is a pilot. So it's still working out the kinks and finding the things that are best, finding out how long students take to do things, what they find really difficult, where to focus your energies, all of those things. There's still a lot of learning to come in the next term. But if you plan a default so that you've got as much done in advance as you can, then you can be much more responsive in your review and update as you go. And yes, they can be recorded beyond the group. They can be shared beyond the group. 
uh, 12 to 16 lectures into online course, possibly without live sessions, what would be the best structure for that? Um, without any live sessions. Uh, so it depends what you're teaching. Ideally, if you've, you're taking all of that lecture content, um, you need to have a variety of activities for that. If you look at, um, <laughs> if you look at how you can, maybe if you've got something that needs to be demonstrated, demonstrate it, make a video with the equipment. I'm sure by autumn time you'll be allowed in the buildings at least to use specific equipment. Then you can provide readings for different things. But uh, ultimately, if you follow the main structure in the template, which is content, 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 then assignment, then response, um, you can easily build a learning cycle out of that. So as the cycle continues, the students are taking stuff in, then getting more active and then getting lots of feedback. So if you've not got live sessions, you really need to make sure that you've got online fora for online forums for discussions um, and you need to be uh, monitoring those quite closely. So those those are I think following the same pattern of passivity to activity through the week would be really helpful um, and yeah make sure that you've got the the forum and again we'll look at that next week a bit more closely kind of managing that and managing your own time <laughs> it's not easy to combine the questions and the presentation but <laughs> it takes some practice okay marvelous are there any other questions still unsure about running lectures online next to face-to-face -face small group teaching. Would that remember resemble a traditional setup just as with lecture recordings on the VLE? Uh, Faiz, it could do that. Um, the lecture recordings, even if you record your lecture and you make it available whenever um, and then give people a deadline to do that in, um, that is, it does look very much like the traditional setup. But given that we have this opportunity to use technology a little bit more flexibly, um, you might want to consider breaking those lectures into smaller pieces or maybe one item would be better as an article that they read. So you have a chance to to rethink what you've what you've done in the past and and find your optimal. And if it is recording a single lecture and making that available, that's fine. What you do need to do is the surround sound on your platform that says, watch this lecture to find out, blah. Why are you doing this? Ask these questions to generate interest and afterwards you ask follow up questions that you can focus on when you come into your next small group teaching session, because it's not just watch this content, see you later. It's watch this content. I now need to see evidence of your learning. And if you let people free to ask all of the questions it might get a little bit out of control they will ha still have those questions and be able to ask them but if you you can focus their minds on the really important parts with your questioning on screen that you then address when you come to live um, live interaction then that could be a really good formula my recordings are too large to upload to moodle um, if you're recording on panopto they are kind of linked to so um, there is guidance from UIS on how to do that. Um, and I've tried, I had to learn to do that for this webinar series. And it is, um, the, the learning curve is steeper than it needs to be, but it's once you know what you're doing, it's very um, intuitive and easy to do. So don't worry about uploading anything to Moodle. You shouldn't upload to Moodle anyway. You should always link to, so bring it in in a light book rather than having it on the platform because it really slows it down. So link out to it instead. Collection of exemplars of use of the technology, tagging videos for responses, live quizzes, whiteboard access while lecturing. Um, so tagging videos for responses, I'm not 100% sure what you mean. You can put questions in your videos depending on the tools that you use. If you have Panopto, you can just slot in a question and people can't get past the question until they've answered. Um, for live quizzes, you can use, there are loads of tools. So you can use Mentimeter, um, there's the polling tool in Teams, um, which is awkward live though. Um, there are tons of them, poll everywhere. If you just 
search for online poll and as long as you're comfortable showing your slides and then coming away to another screen and then coming back to your main screen um, practice that maybe with some friendly academic um, colleagues uh, before you do it in front of your students maybe then that would be that would be really good and whiteboard access there's a whiteboard on here too on teams so if in the share under the share button there's a whiteboard that you can share and lots of people can um, can do. OK, Andrew, I'm delighted they will be getting some provisions, whichever way it happens to be um, delivered, as long as everybody's comfortable. That's cool. OK. Um, OK, so have a look at the Moodle instructions for linking to videos. Um, that's your best way is is it and also look up the instructions from UIS about using Panopto and put your videos on that. That's your absolute best option. Yes, I know it only pertains to lectures, absolutely. Um, but we still have to look at the whole picture. Um, yeah, I know. Well, <laughs> it's not that Cambridge isn't, isn't special at all, so I'm sure we will get noticed. Um, and in fact, I would be interested to see what other universities are, are thinking of similar options. Um, emails with links, yes. There's information in the pre-seminar, in the pre-webinar uh, activities prior to the second webinar. So go to the second webinar's material and look at the pre uh, pre-materials. If you're looking about teaching with quizzes. Um, yes, if you're at Cambridge, Panopto is your way forward for using videos. OK. OK. I'm not surprised your daughter is concerned. There's there's a lot of unknowns and it's quite difficult to um, to tell exactly what's going to happen. But we can only make the best decisions that we can and plan for the best insurance against change and the more difficulty bit. Well, I hope not. <laughs> OK, right. It's five past three. Thank you very much uh, for participating and I hope I'll see you next week. Take care.